Hi there, it's me. How you guys doing? It's nice to talk to you. It's really interesting. I get to see your faces in my head, just not in person, which I think is pretty funny. Um, let me get this on presenter view so you can see what I'm going to be doing. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So um, I got to tell you, I've been on the road since April. We started in Taiwan, uh, got home from Taiwan two weeks later, left for Germany. Was in Germany for two weeks. Am I there? Was in Germany for two weeks. Went to England for five days to do filming and to prep for the London seminar in September. Came home. My daughter graduated from college on Sunday, yay, the 17th. And then I left for Philadelphia on Wednesday. So it has been an action-packed, fun-filled couple of months. And then when my flight was delayed and I didn't get home until one o'clock in the morning on Monday night this week, it's kind of like my brain just went on revolt. So I only have two cases. Usually I have four or five or six for this practitioner webinar. Um, so we're going to have time at the end for questions or cases that you might have. But the two cases that we did, one was in Germany and one was in, Ad in um, Philadelphia, there have been way more cases. I just, my brain just isn't working. So uh, the title of this webinar is Surprises, because both of these cases were surprises. These two cases were both surprises. Like, I've been doing FSM for, what, 25 years now? And pretty much I figured that we had everything dialed in. There was, you know, it's everything, an awful lot of stuff is pretty well standardized. You know what's coming, you know what it's going to take, you know what pathologies are involved. I was ready. I'm right. And then there were surprises this month. So the first one was treating asthma. When we were in Germany at Bad Malheim, the seminar was for, there were 50 people there. And one of the practitioners uh, at the seminar was a lady with asthma. Um, she lives in Germany, but she's Indian, from India. And um, she said, with a kind of soft voice that had a lot of gurgling involved in her breathing, she said, I have had asthma for 40 years. I want you to treat me. And I was like, yeah, asthma is easy, is what my brain is thinking. This is easy. Um, and the practitioners at her table, she just didn't get a chance to be the patient for any sort of visceral treatment. So we got to um, uh, Friday and the fifth day of the seminar. So we had five days of seminar in Germany. We got to Friday afternoon and she hadn't been treated. And she said, remember, you promised. So every day she came up to me and she said, remember, you promised. And um, I said, okay, okay. So come on, at this point, it was the end of the day on Friday. We closed the seminar and um, there were about 10 practitioners and their, uh, the time waiver device were sitting there. And I said, okay, let's, she said, remember you promised. So we sat down at a massage table and I sat at the head and put a contact behind her chest, behind her back and another one across her chest. She was just really gurgly. The, the asthma was bad. She'd been on steroids for 25 years, inhaled or oral. She'd been in the hospital multiple times. She had asthma really bad. Uh, she was on oral medication. And as I do, I asked her, when did this start? What started it? What caused it? And she said, it started when I was, she was a teenager. And I had a strep infection that affected my tonsils. They took out my tonsils. And shortly thereafter, I got asthma. I have had asthma ever since. So you could think of the asthma as just being related to the trauma, just concussion protocol activating the tubercular gene. She was a pretty classic tubercular constitutional type for those of you that have taken the advanced. She was a pretty typical 
work of art, very slender, very um, almost delicate is the way I think of the tubercular constitutional type. There was something that just said, don't treat her for inflammation. Don't treat her for inflammation. So I ran to 94, 329, and a spasm in the bronchi. Now, the treatment for asthma has been the same for 20 years. Treatment for asthma has been the same for 20 years. It's when you, what's in your auto care, what's in your custom care. And something said, you know, that little voice that's on my shoulder, the little bird, the little bird said, don't run this. So, John Carlos is allergy reaction, spasm in the bronchi, 64 is the bronchi, inflammation, chronic inflammation. Sometimes asthma is associated with toxicity, so you run that, you know, vitality. And asthma is a piece of cake, right? It's easy. A little fibrosis, a little scarring in the bronchi with some breathing, and you're done. Until now, until this last year, in this last year, I've had three cases where this protocol would have paid the patient very much worse, it turned out. All three patients had a history of infection. So this patient in Germany, her asthma, remember, her asthma started when she had a strep infection that went to her tonsils. She had her tonsils removed, and after the tonsils were removed, she had asthma. Treating asthma has always been kind of the same thing until now. So these three cases made me think about when is asthma not allergy reaction, spasm, and inflammation in the bronchi. So it's the thought process that's important. The frequencies are not that big a deal. It's the concept. How do you tell when not to use 40 if your intuition is not like hypervigilant like mine is? All of these patients had really very noisy, very rattly, raspy breathing. All three of them were chronic. Now I have to tell you that in 23 years of treating asthma, I've never treated anybody with the protocol that worked on this lady from Germany. So all three were really chronic. All three had really raspy breathing. All three had an unusual onset history. It's not like asthma just showed up when they were seven or 10 or 12. All had onset after some sort of infection or mold exposure. One of them had uh, her asthma start when she was 30. That is highly unusual and it started after a mold exposure. This lady had her asthma started in her teenage years, which is pretty characteristic, but it was after the strep infection. The other patient I saw that like this was also strep infection. So we had tonsils, strep infection, mold exposure, and um, the third patient had um, viral, viral infection or pneumonia, which she wasn't sure which. So those are the three that have shown up in the last year. And when they show up like that, it kind of makes you think that the universe is trying to give me a message. So asthma that starts after infections appears to be a whole different category. They respond to asthma medication, but all three have been on steroids for extended periods of time. Um, they, the, the asthma is very aggressive. It's very immunologically active. All three of them had had numerous hospitalizations and none of them had been treated for infection by anyone. And it was really just something that made the hair on the back of my neck stand up that told me not to run 40 just in case infection was involved. If you reduce inflammation in the bronchi, it's going to be inf make the infection worse. With this patient, I ran, I wasn't gonna run 40, but I ran 29, spasm in the bronchi, and that helped a little bit, relieved it, made her feel a little bit lighter. I ran allergy reaction or histamine in the bronchi, that felt pretty good. She had an infection that started it, so I ran pus and pus encapsulated, 64 and 42 and 64 and 63. I ran 9740 and 9820, the fermentative and putrefactive toxin, 
And then I ran the frequencies for strep because she said it started after a strep infection that infected her tonsils. Well, she didn't have her tonsils anymore, so I didn't run that, but I ran three of these five, six frequencies we have for strep. I ran 60, I ran 131 and 243, all with 64 for strep in the bronchi. And sure enough, that reduced her wheezing and made her a little bit less gurgling. She's still quite wheezy, still quite distressed breathing, still unable to take a deep breath. And after I ran infection, I thought, well, maybe it's just her bronchi are so scarred that she has really shallow breathing. So I ran scarring in the bronchi and um, had her take a deeper breath. And um, sure enough, when she took that deep breath, it started a coughing spell that rattled clear down into her diaphragm. It was ferocious. She ended up sitting up and sitting up and fumbling for a Kleenex or a handkerchief and coughed up what had to be two, three tablespoons of khaki green mucus. It was gross. And she said, yes, this is what comes up. And I went, I thought, green is not a normal color for mucus. Green mucus is infected. What's up with that? So there was a student sitting next to me, one of this group of 10 that stayed behind to see how this was gonna turn out. And the student sitting next to me said, in Italy, we call this Qatar. And it's like, wait, I, I have a frequency for Qatar in the advance. So I pulled out my advance list. Now, mind you, in 21, 23 years of doing this, I've never used this frequency. The frequency for Qatar is 17 hertz on channel A, and we were dealing with 64 hertz, the bronchi, and probably 15 hertz, the trachea, because that's what the tissue that initiates this really deep coughing. So I did 17 hertz on A and 64 hertz on B. The surprising asthma patient, <coughs> when I use 17 hertz, on A and 64 hertz on B, her wheezing went down, her breathing got quieter. Um, as soon as it got quieter and quieter and stopped changing, I went back to 13 hertz on A and 64 on B. B she had her take a deep breath. And it's almost like when we got rid of the scarring of the bronchi, her bronchi expanded and the fibrosis um, the dissolved and uncovered these pockets of infection and mucus and whatever uh, crud in her bronchi. So she coughed up another couple of tablespoons of green, green mucus. Then I went to back to 17 on A and the bronchi 64 and B and 15 is the trachea. And that pretty much further reduced the wheezing, but it was still present. And then the next catarrhal frequency is the one from the core. 52 on A and 72 on B. And I don't remember when the last time you took a core was, but every time I get to these on the Abrams frequencies, I say, I don't know what this is for. I think it's like fur balls, <laughs> you know, like cough, but I've never used it, like literally until this day in Germany, I had never used these frequencies combinations. And 52 on A and 72 on B, it's an AB pair for catarrhal toxin and her wheezing in completely went away, like gone, like her breathing was normal. We treated scarring, it was gone. It was gone. So um, apparently this kind of asthma is what this is for. So treating this kind of asthma, pay attention to the history. So if it started after some sort of mold exposure, a viral infection or some sort of bacterial infection, obviously avoid 40 because if you turn off the inflammation and the bronchi are problematic because they're infected, it's gonna make the infection worse when the inflammation is turned off for two to four to six hours. 29, spasm of the bronchi will help. Allergy reaction of the bronchi will help. 
pus and pus encapsulated help, fermentated and putrefactive toxin, 9740 and 9820. Those helped. 20-theta is the frequency from the advanced, and 95 is the frequency from the advanced for mold, so 64 and 15. I had one patient of these three that responded really well to that. Strep and the bronchi, there are another two frequencies for strep. They didn't work in this particular patient, but they might work in yours. And then catarrhal toxin, 17 on A and 64 on B. What is it doing that stops the asthma? I got to tell you, I have no idea. All I can think of is that somehow the infection changes signaling in the bronchi and or the immune system. And when we remove the pattern of catarrhal toxin in the bronchi, the asthma is changed. Um, then catarrhal toxin from Abrams, 52 and 72, that is the other kind of thing that, uh, that's the other frequency that changed her symptoms, like dramatically. So is this going to work on every patient with infectious asthma? Mm, probably not because this lady was strep, I'm not sure. Like literally, this is the first time I've ever used catarrh. I didn't even use the catarrhal toxin on my mold patient or my first infection patient, just this one, because the lady from Italy said, in Italy, we call this catarrh. Now I have no idea. So it may not work on everybody, but if the history suggests that it's inflammatory, that is infectious, treat for infection, and see what happens. So what was the follow-up for this lady? Well, she was told that she had a unit. She bought a unit at the seminar. She was told to treat with this protocol three times a week, at least. And she was also told to go home and find someone to put her on antibiotics for 10 days. She's literally had an infection in her bronchi for 40 years, subacute, subclinical, kept in a subacute occult state by the steroids she takes. It just it paralyzes the immune system. And so it's been contained by the steroids and the medications since she was 20. She's now, well, she's 14. Um, she's now 54, so it's been 40 years. So I told her to go home and go on antibiotics for 10 days, azithromycin or Augmentin, or I don't like Cipro or the fluoroquinolones. And you're gonna have to talk somebody into giving her antibiotics. So I think the green mucus is a clue. Mucus should not be green. It should be clear or white. If it's green, it's infected. That's kind of a truism, right? She's supposed to keep drinking more water, increase her fluid intake to thin out the mucus. She could take a mucolytic, either an herb or the, the over-the-counter product. And then once they have the infection cleared up, so once she's off of uh, antibiotics, be sure and treat for scarring in the bronchi, the fascia, and the intercostal nerves and the intercostal costal fascia, and probably also the trachea. So after the asthma is cleared up, you still need to increase the range of motion in the bronchi and the trachea to make sure that those tissues can expand and respond normally. Um, and then when your range of motion and your chest expansion has been restricted for 40 years, um, the nerves, 396, get adhered to the fascia and the connective tissue and ultimately to the periosteum that are on the ribs. So that's the musculoskeletal part of this is to increase range of motion and the chest excursion so she can then breathe normally. Uh, now this is all hypothetical because I only saw her that one time in Germany. So pretty much when you try this, see what happens. Does the antibiotic change her asthma? Is this an infection that you can clear up that way? Is she going to have to use IV vitamin C or some other anti infection or herbs or whatever? Some other treatment for the bacterial infection. It's not viral. Green stuff is, I can't imagine it being viral. I guess it could be, but strep changed it. 
So my money is still on bacterial infection. I still put her on antibiotics for 10 days. I hope somebody does it and I hope she follows up with me. I hope she's listening to this and recognizes herself. So we'll see what happens. This next case happened in Philadelphia. This just last weekend. One of the students brought in her 14-year-old son. He was uh, to be a patient on Saturday night um, at the end of the day, or Friday night at the end of the day. He was born um, shoulder first. It's called shoulder dystocia. And um, he got stuck, um, as you can imagine. And um, so they, they pull, pulled on his arm and basically tore his brachial plexus at birth. Um, he had some other injuries. His APGAR score was pretty horrible, um, like it was zero at birth. And then I guess at one or two minutes afterwards, it was up into the closer to normal range. And then at three, four minutes, he was fine. So it wasn't a hypoxic brain injury. He's quite bright, he enjoys sports, he enjoys school. Um, so there's no long-term developmental change. But this brachial plexus injury at birth said that the muscles in his left arm did not move and he was not able to use them at birth. So they did not connect with his brain during the sensitive period for the motor development that happens between birth and, I don't know, when did they start crawling? Eight, 10 months. So he didn't use his left arm. According to his brain, that left arm didn't exist. So he had surgery at the age of eight with the muscles that did work. So he had some muscles in his shoulder that worked, but he couldn't abduct. He couldn't put his arm behind his back. He had a lot of biomechanical um, and function abnormalities. Um, he had surgery, I think he was around eight when they moved one of the teres muscles so he would have something that served as an external rotator to help balance the movement. So they just moved the muscle. Good news for us was he had no pain, which was really wonderful. His current symptoms were muscle atrophy. He had no pec major, like none on the left. A little bit of pec minor, but the pec major was gone. The deltoid was, uh, posterior deltoid was gone. He had spasticity in the wrist and the hand muscles. He had spasticity in the biceps. It was just wicked tight. And he had specific muscles that simply were not developed and not firing. Pectoralis major and minor and the deltoid are the ones that come to mind. Um, he can't abduct his shoulders. So if he wants to lift his hand up, he uses his upper trap. The supraspinatus simply doesn't work. Um, the spasticity in his wrist. So his wrist is flexed. His hand is spastic and, and flexed. He cannot supinate the forearm, so his supinators are gone. They just don't work. So supination is where you take your hand and you make it from palm down to palm up. Can't do that at all. So the inability to do that motion interfered with his ability to do anything coordinated with his forearm. Because his biceps was so spastic, his elbow was stuck in flexion. He couldn't straighten his arm because the biceps was spastic. So when you think about spasticity, you have to think about upper motor neuron injuries. So, um, but once you have a diagnosis of brachial plexus traction injury, nobody thinks of anything else. So even though the symptoms didn't actually match a brachial plexus traction injury, if you tear your brachial plexus, you don't have spasticity. You have flaccidity. The muscles are flaccid. They're not flaccid. They're not spastic. So if their biceps and the hand and wrist flexors are spastic, it's not the brachial plexus. It's central. And um, that was a clue. My problem was I've never worked with these kind of complex neurologic uh, birth injury sorts of cases. Fortunately for us, we had a physical therapist and an occupational therapist in the class that were really used to working with this. And they knew 
what it meant when certain muscles were spastic and certain muscles were um, atrophied, just not developed and not firing. So because his diagnosis was a brachial plexus traction injury, I started out with the standard treatment for a brachial plexus traction injury. Towel around the neck, towel on the hand, um, and at the long thoracic nerve, around 40 and 396, and that should have made the atrophied muscles pop up. Didn't do anything, like nothing. No change in atrophy, no change in strength, no change in spasticity. I thought that was pretty weird. And um, the peripheral contacts were the hand, the chest, and the forearm, depending on what nerves we wanted to address. But I played with all of them. It took me about 20 minutes. And then I thought, well, maybe there's scars. So I ran scarring in the nerve. And that didn't do anything, right? So maybe the nerves were scarred down, and that caused muscle inhibition. And then um, I tried to increase secretions and vitality in the nerve to reconnect the nerve to the muscles. And that didn't do anything. So the surprise for this was it didn't work. In brachial plexus traction injuries, the treatment never doesn't work. That is to say, it always works. So the conclusion had to be, if it isn't a brachial plexus traction injury, what is it? All right. Fortunately for me, there were two seminar practitioners, students, a physical therapist and an occupational therapist that knew their way around this kind of complex case. So they said, agreed between the two of them and said to the class, when the nerve was injured at birth, it meant that these nerves and muscles were never connected to the motor cortex at birth. It's kind of like he had a stroke, but it's not actually, it's, it acts like a stroke, but it wasn't from a stroke. It was because they never connected to the sensory and motor cortex. Sensory and motor cortex didn't know that those muscles existed. So it acted like a stroke and therefore had spasticity. So if you remember from the, the webinar from last month, when we talked about how we treated the stroke patient in Taiwan. How would you treat it if it was a stroke? So we put a second, we kept one machine on 40 and 396. We put a second machine, we actually we switched that machine to 81 and 92 with the contacts at the neck and the hand. So we switched the machine from 40 and 396 to 81 and 92. And that started reducing spasticity distally first. So first the hand relaxed, then the wrist relaxed, then the spasticity in the forearm relaxed. And as the spasticity went down, the OT started asking him to coordinate movement, make this muscle tap into my shoulder, uh, tap into my fingers, move into my fingers, make your shoulder go up or forward or back. She had him do very gentle movements and he couldn't do it. Now, the spasticity was going down, but as she wanted him to coordinate movement, it's like, well, we have a frequency that does that. So we put a second machine on from neck to hand, and that was 81 and 84 to increase secretions in the cerebellum with the contacts at the neck down to T2, because that's where the brachial plexus is, and then down to the waist and the hand, and that began coordinating movement. And honestly, it was amazing to see the pec major begin to fire. Now, the first thing we did, oh, I forgot, I forgot about that. First thing we did was when he laid down on the table, his hamstrings were so tight, like he couldn't straighten his legs. If he straightened his legs, his trunk would flex. Well, in my world, right, that is always scarring in the dura. So I was showing off and I had a a uh, unit from his neck to his feet, and I ran scarring in the dura, and the hamstrings didn't change at all. It's like, what's up with that? Never doesn't work. So after about 15 minutes, it's like, okay, if it's not scarring in the hamstrings, not scarring in the dura, what's wrong with the hamstrings? Why are they so tight? 
was 81 and 10. Remember how 81 and 10 increasing descending inhibition in the spinal cord will leave spasticity in the adductors, the quads, and the hamstrings. So we kept that unit from neck to feet. It, was, it started out running scarring in the dura. That didn't work. We switched it to 81 and 10. And eventually his hamstrings relaxed, his legs went straight. He was able to straighten his legs and his straight leg raise went to about 70 degrees, I think. So that was so cool. So at this point, he has three machines on his body, right? One uh, neck to chest um, on the arm running 81 and 92 to reduce spasticity. One uh, neck to the chest and arm running increased secretions in the cerebellum to coordinate movement. Those two made, made sense, right? And 81 and 92 ultimately even reduced the spasticity in his, in his biceps. And then that one unit running from neck to feet with 81 and 10 increasing secretions in the cerebellum, um, or sorry, increasing secretions of descending inhibit, inhibition in the spinal cord that reduced spasticity. Then once the movement was restored, they needed to eliminate the scar tissue between the nerve and the fascia and to kind of make the capsule around the elbow more mobile. So they used 13 and 396 with movement to sort of mobilize the brachial plexus. Um, and that took care of that. It was pretty amazing. What was interesting, I'm gonna actually add a new slide. I think you guys can still see this, right? The follow-up with him, what was interesting was when he came, let's see, he was first treated on Friday. When he came in Sunday night, so this is two days later, he still had the relaxed muscles, spasticity remained uh, low or eliminated. He still had um, some aberrant motion. If you think about it, his brain hadn't moved those muscles in that pattern um, in, well, he's 14, so ever, 14 years. And he responded to 81 and 92, 81 and 84, and 81 and 10 with more normal movement. And this normal movement allowed the OT to cue him and basically do therapy to restore normal movement. So he, his mom was a practitioner in the course. She purchased two custom care units programmed with the frequencies that were affected. And um, she also made an appointment or an agreement to travel to North Carolina to see the occupational therapist who was working with him. So he made so much progress in that period of time that we expect that he will, like at the end of it, he actually had a pectoralis muscle where there wasn't one. He had an anterior deltoid where there, a lateral deltoid where there wasn't one. 
he had an infraspinatus and a supraspinatus where there wasn't one. He had a relaxed biceps and he actually had um, a forearm f extensor muscles and he was able to effectively supinate. So in basically three hours, they did a lifetime's worth of work in, in occupational and physical therapy to repattern his movements. It was extraordinary. So those were the surprises. I guess the take home message from these case reports is, it's not always what you thought it was. Um, the frequency response will tell you in both cases, the fact that the history in the first case, the asthma case, the fact that the history suggested it was infection and the little bird on my shoulder says, don't you dare run the frequency to reduce inflammation. And then when the brachial plexus treatment didn't work. So the treatment will tell you what it is that is going to work, I guess, because what you expected to work, expected to work didn't work. So pay attention to the frequency response. There's that I'd say that's the best part about FSM is that because the frequencies always do what they're alleged to do, the frequency response will tell you what to do. And in this case, it was pretty surprising. The fact that it wasn't actually a peripheral injury, it wasn't the brachial plexus, it was all central. And it was because he hadn't had a stroke, but he also didn't have any descending inhibition or descending motor signaling that was coordinated to his left arm because there were no there was no connection the connections between the arm and the brain were never made when he was an infant so it's always quite a wonderful learning opportunity so that's where i am um we've got how many people on 15 yeah 16 16 16 so we got 16 people on if there's anybody there that has questions or cases that you can think of let me know and we'll make some slides and put everybody on the same page i think there's a little icon someplace that says chat or raise your hand or whatever kevin's going to read those come on don't be shy <laughs> Frequency sponsors. No, nobody has any questions. You guys are awesome. Hey, we're going to get finished early. We got about 12 minutes to go. Yep, somebody. I've been treating a patient for several weeks for several back and hip injuries. Mm -hmm. She suddenly got loose stool. Treating a patient for several weeks <laughs> for back and hip yeah. injuries, and she suddenly got loose stools. Yeah. Well, okay, which part of the back? It, the first thing is it could be a coincidence. So did she get a virus? Did she get some sort of food or bug exposure that's going to give her diarrhea? Um, could it be, depending on what part of her back you're treating, um, if it's the thoracic spine and you change the sympathetic outflow to the intestines and the parasympathetic outflow to the intestines, then... She says no illness or bugs. We're sure it's not bugs. Yeah. Okay. Where's this? Can you go to the top? Can you yeah, click on Q and A? You can see the question. Oh, could he? Uh, no illness or bugs. Lumbar discs. Thoracic discs or lumbar discs? Answer live. That's me. Yeah. <laughs> Loose stools and lumbar spine. Well, the problem with the lumbar spine is it doesn't actually go to the, you know, colon. Um, I find you need all run of the 81s to get, all right, let's finish with Laura first. Loose stills in the lumbar, I guess I do um, 
for two weeks. Is she taking magnesium for the muscles by any chance? Loose stools and lumbar spine doesn't add up. I guess try 40 and 396. I don't know. That's a good question. I'd go looking for the gut and see what else could be calling, causing loose stools or something there. I've never had disc or nerve treatment um, to cause diarrhea. It just doesn't, I've never seen it before. So I don't know what could be causing it. I go looking for something that happened two weeks ago on that, on that patient, Laura. Uh, Monique, do you find you need to, yeah, do all three of the 81s to get this excessive movement? Yes, actually. Um, because we did just 81 and 92, that relieved the spasticity, but the sensory cortex doesn't coordinate movement, the cerebellum does. So I guess if we had just one precision carry, you could go from 92 to 84, but the fact that we actually had three precision carriers on him, one with the sensory motor cortex to reconnect the brain to the muscles, one with the cerebellum to coordinate the movement, one to the spinal cord to reduce spasticity. Um, I, it was amazing. I've actually never done this before. This, so I've been doing this 20 some odd years. I've never done this before through machines with those, all those 81s. And I've never seen a patient like this before. It's why I teach you to speak the language so that you'll um, have an idea about how to treat it. You're welcome, Laura. Um, okay, Paula, 70 year old patient after an MVA with an electron, uh, ick, electron on pinning, elbow fracture, suck, elbow range of motion of 20 degrees to 80 degrees, 91. Very painful at end range, feels like, okay. So, 91 with the joint capsule, the nerve fibrosis in the capsule and tendon. I look at scarring in the nerve, right? And then scarring in the periosteum. And then if she still has the pins in, go to metallic toxin from the advanced, like if they use stainless steel pins and she's allergic to that, or if she's one of the 43% of people that are allergic to titanium and that's what the pins are made of. Now it's 27% with titanium is 43% with chromium and stainless. So scarring in the nerves, scarring in the capsule, scarring in the periosteum. Um, yeah. And then metallic toxin, very painful at the end of the range. So at the end of the range, you're going to look at the bone bumping into the bone. The olecranon is a very complicated joint. Structurally, it's just shaped weird. Um, so feels like it's going to break. That kind of points you at bone, doesn't it? I wonder what that's about. Treat that and then email me and let me know if it worked, okay? Uh, periosteum nerve is what comes up nine weeks post. Oh yeah, the dreaded 10 week limit. Well, start taking apart scar tissue in the bone and the nerve and whatever. Oh, Monique. Your son was born with a similar situation, all that makes sense. Excited to try it, yay! How old is he now? Oh, that's Monique. Uh, okay, Paula says, I didn't try scarring. Did you try scarring in the periosteum? She tried scarring in the nerve. Um, ooh, the son is six. Oh, goody! Okay, so the, Monique, back to Monique now. Older son is six. He has not had surgery then to transpose the muscles, which will make some things a lot easier. Um, yeah, so with a six-year-old, I'd use wraps um, and see what you can do. 81, I started with 81 and 10. Run the concussion protocol if you haven't already done that on him. And... Um, and then 81 and 10, 81 and 92. You can use, if what you have is custom cares for him, you can program custom cares to run single frequency combinations for like an hour. 
and then go with that. Um, didn't try pre treating scarring back to Paula. So the elbow didn't try scarring in the periosteum. I hope that helps. Um, you might also try torn and broken in the tendon and torn and broken in the bone. Weird. Okay, Kiara, how nice. Oh dear, did have surgery to extend tendons. Okay, Monique, good luck. Let me know how it turns out. Um, okay, Kiara Galbraith, I do have a question. I've been treating a young man who had meningitis at two years of age, which resulted in being in a coma for months. Uck. Oh dear, when he woke up, he was blind, deaf, and paralyzed. He does respond and he can see and hear, but his brain doesn't understand what he's mutant. Oh, yikes. Okay, so I'm, I'm assuming it's viral meningitis. It might have been bacterial, so you treat for the original infection. Uh, do the brain parts, so the verbal centers are, it's all the cortex. Maybe the medulla, maybe the hindbrain. Paralyzed, so it's like if you treat the basics in those brain parts, and I would also go to, it's not even the basal ganglia, it's uphill from that. Um, and so I would go to do the basics on those brain parts and then do 81 and the brain part. I would start with the motor cortex and the frontal cortex, so 92 and 90. And um, here's the thing, I, I'd leave the midbrain alone. It's just like running 81 and 89 will just make somebody crazy. It just jacks up the hippocampus and the amygdala and it's just not, not any fun. So um, do the brain part, treat for increasing secretions at the end of it. And I'd treat him from neck to feet and see what you get. Okay, Laura Franklin, I don't know what happened to the chat box. Oh, Kira has done all the brain parts. Um, so we'll go back up here. Okay, let me finish with Monique. Okay. Client with polio, making great process. Yeah, tw I think 23 is the frequency for polio, right? Um, and yes, it did take 81 for an hour. Uh, and then Kara says she already has done all that stuff, and that just means it's broken. It's kind of like there's too much gone and we can't help. I guess then just run 970 and balance the energy centers and see if you can make his life more pleasant. That's just really difficult. Okay, chat, where do I go? Where am I, Kevin? Oh, I'm sorry. That's right. Uh, Chat? Huh? Somebody. Where's your chat box? I don't know. I don't know where my chat box is. Laura, find a different way to put it in. I got it on my screen. Right? Okay, what's the question? Okay, so Laura, it's kind of long. I emailed, uh, emailed you earlier regarding a patient that was self reported PHN. She got shingles after receiving shingles vaccine. Of course. She has been on prednisone for her uh, UC. Perhaps running a toxin frequency might help? No, not toxins. Post-terpedic yeah. Post neuralgia after the vaccine means that it's you need to treat for the mutation, 236 and 435. And then post neuralgia, how old is she? Um, with post neuralgia, especially if it's pretty chronic, you need to treat the cord and the midbrain, so 40 and 10 and 40 and 89 to get down the central sensitization and the denervation and then treat the nerve separately. So it's, a, it's another two machine uh, product, uh, protocol. Um, treat the cord from neck to feet. And um, if she has ulcerative colitis, her immune system is, and if she's on steroids, it's like, yuck. Yeah, and she doesn't ever get to get it. Anybody with ulcerative colitis should never get a vaccine ever again, but that's another conversation. Um, yeah, it's bacterial meningitis, bummer. Problem is, oh, I'm bummed. Client with polio, that's good. She already did that. 
59 years old, two years not chronic, not currently on steroids. I'd still try, um, I'd still try um, two machines and truth your immune system. Kind of wonder if treating the vagus might help. Um, if you get a chance, come to the advanced and we'll, we were going to do that, the Vegas protocol, the Vegas lecture again. Um, and Kiara, I don't know about how to connect the optic nerve to the brain. That's just really tough. Sometimes it's just karma, right? Laura, things I have not tried. I've been doing the Vegas. It helped the ulcerative colitis. Oh, I'm glad to know that works. Okay, William, oral lichen planus. No, three titanium, oops. Three titanium dental implants led to oral lichen planus. Uh, penicillin G, really? Okay, given just prior to, oh, that's nice. Uh, given prior to the implants, two weeks of implants in thoracic shingles. No. Well, yay, I'm glad you treated the shingles, but yuck. So maybe, I don't know. I don't know about the lichen planus, Bill, William. Um, it is trimetallic toxin, 13. And maybe yeast. I just don't know enough. And maybe... Um, Fermentative and putrefactive toxin? I, I don't know enough about lichen planus. Hold that thought, get back to us next time. This is cool, I should do f this every time. This is really fun. Oh goody, Laura's gonna be there in San Francisco. Yay, and I'm so glad. Oh Jesus, uh, no, okay. It, Kira, I'm really glad he's had money. No, you, you don't run 40 in the parasympathetics. Of course, they're going to be sick if you do that. Inflammation in the parasympathetics is not inflammation. You just reduce the activity of the parasympathetics and it's going to make you feel nauseous. Yucky dizzy nauseous. That's nope. That's if you run 40 and 709, I can guarantee you people are going to feel yucky dizzy and nauseous. So don't do that. Sympathetics, 40 and 562, usually quiets the sympathetics and makes people feel relaxed. But you have to remember that the parasympathetics work backwards in order to make your digestion work and your blood pressure go down and your heart rate go down. You, uh, you want to increase the activity of the parasympathetics. If you <laughs> quiet the activity um, of the parasympathetics, it is... Um, it's going to make things yucky. So that's, that's going to be easy to fix. 35 and 102 is not going to fix the nausea. You just imbalance the autonomic nervous system and just kind of try and undo what you did. Um, quiet the sympathetics in general makes you feel better. 49 vitality in the parasympathetics and vitality in the vagus are pretty predictable. Oral lichen planus is an autoimmune problem. Well, okay, but that isn't what it is, right? So it's been helped by a gluten-free diet, but oral lichen, back, we're back to William and the oral lichen planus. I don't know if you guys can see this screen. Um, it's an autoimmune response, but what actually is going on in the cells? I don't, I don't know if enough about it. So gluten-free diet is going to help. It reduces the inflammation, but it's not an inflammatory condition. Somehow the immune system is changing the um, oral mucosa. So there's a frequency or frequencies in the advance for the mucosal tissue in the nose and mouth. So maybe you can play with that. I don't know. Wow, this is really cool. Thanks, guys. Um, all right, we don't have anything scheduled for next month yet, but Kevin will send you out, when is that, July? Um, I'm having cataract surgery on August 1st, that's pretty exciting. Um, I'm on planes on the 30th, uh, we could do 
July 31st is the time when we could do a webinar. So we'll either do a webinar the 31st or sometime in the middle of um, August, but we'd like to do one a month, so I'll do one in July. And meanwhile, keep up the good work, do good things. Um, I want to go back to the webinar and just remind you about the basic principles, which are to think about changing the pattern, treating the cause of whatever got it started, and then supporting the stable state. Um, really? Oh, come on, you guys. Um, if you haven't seen the new FAQ brochure, it is awesome. Um, I really like it. The cover sort of goes with the resonance effect. If you don't have copies of the resonance effect in your office to hand out patients, you'll find that people really respond well to it and your patients read it and they give it to their friends and it helps you grow your practice and uh, gives you credibility when they find out how what you're doing uh, was created and how it works. Um, we are going to the FSM website. Practitioner list will become subscription July something. They're going to get an email next week you're to gonna, sign up. Okay, you're going to get an email next week to encourage you to sign up. If you have just recently taken the course seminar, you get the first year free if you're a, an established practitioner in practice. We're going to ask you for $89 a year, which is um, really, really reasonable. It's just that maintaining the practitioner list on the website has just become a huge expense and we've got to do something. And we have to keep the practitioner list accurate and up to date. We have practitioners on there that are dead and who stop using FSM or don't use it. And if you're using FSM, we want to know and we want to let your patients know that you're using it. People will find you from the website and as the resonance effect gets out, out there we've sold thousands of copies um, patients will come looking for you they will find you and we need to make sure that that practitioner list is effective and accurate so it's 89 dollars a year then there'll be an ear, a yearly auto renewal that you can do um, so that's coming up you'll get an email next week Remember the magnetic converter is really cool. It's great for wound care, home treatments, long treatments in the PTSD protocol, post-op care because there's nothing wet or sticky. Um, it works for most things. I still don't think it's gonna work very well for nerve pain or 40 and 10 fibro. Um, remember that if you publish a case report, write it up, I'll help you. I'll write the method section, we have a research assistant that will help with, with the literature search. If it's a collected case report, um, Walter Gregory will help you um, do the statistics. Um, publish a case report and uh, we, I will happily give you a check for a thousand dollars at the advanced. We give it out um, uh, at that event every year. Um, send a friend to the core. That's how we spread the most. The core seminars are filling up. Denver is going to be closed at 40 or 44. We haven't decided. That's a couple of weeks from now. London will be there in September 13 to 16. You can take it as a repeat and have a nice vacation in London. Jacksonville in October, Minneapolis in November, San Francisco in December. Phoenix a core seminar is March 14th to 17th. Kim Pittis is doing the FSM sports seminar March 18 and 19. There's an instructor training on the 20th, and I highly recommend that if you enjoy teaching, enjoy sharing what you know, and enjoy spreading FSM, that you take the course and that you take the course seminar instructor training on March 20th, and um, and help us out at the seminars next year, and uh, help us keep FSM alive after I'm gone. Um, the advanced course will be March 21st and 22nd. The faculty is going to be great. I'm so excited about it. And the symposium is March 23rd and 24th. We have Jim Oshman and um, what, I knew her name just a minute ago. Uh, she's an MD, PhD who has actually patented the use of frequencies for infection. And you'll have your colleagues 
um, from around the country and around the world coming to do case reports. Uh, folks from Germany, Diana Cross is coming from Australia. Um, the symposium this year is going to be a don't miss it sort of event. If you can possibly make it, we're going to be back in Phoenix um, where the weather is nice and there are no slot machines. So we're all excited about that. And just to remind you, this is what you're doing. You're all changing medicine one patient at a time. And I get to change patients' lives by training one practitioner at a time. And it's so exciting to see what you do with FSM. And what I do is nice because it broke ground, but the more important piece is what you're going to do with it. And just keep in mind that when you change one life, you end up changing the world. Thanks for joining me, and we'll see you at the end of July. Love you lots. Bye.